Welcome to Gotta Run With Will. My name is Evan Wood. I'm your guest host for today. And I'm super excited and honored to be introducing my very special guest today. He is the director of the New York City chapter of Achilles International. He is a triathlete, he's a coach, and he's a Paralympics trial qualifier. Francesco Magisano, welcome to the show. Awesome, man. Happy to be here. Awesome. I guess really just to start this out, uh, congratulations. You just ran your first Boston Marathon. Uh, you had an amazing time there. Uh, I'm sure you're feeling on top of the world and also maybe a little bit sore. <laughs> How are you feeling right now? I'm feeling good. Well, it was both of our first, right? That's right. Definitely going down some stairs. <laughs> it's uh, it's feeling a little, you know, touchy. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm feeling good. I think the more marathons I do, right, the more volume I put in the legs, the, the faster the recovery comes. Like, totally. I, just, I remember the first time I did a marathon and I couldn't walk for a week and Right, we were just talking this morning, yeah. which is what two days after, three days after the marathon. Like yeah. we both did it our first like two runs. Days. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I guess exactly. it was three. <laughs> so yeah, no, it's good. It's good. Awesome. Glad to hear it. For our audience who's not super familiar with you, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, you know, where are you from? How you got introduced to Achilles International? Mm -hmm. How you got introduced to athletics? Just give us a little back backstory on you. Cool. Yeah. So I grew up in New York uh, my whole life, and I was diagnosed with eye cancer when I was ten months old. And so I was you know, totally blind growing up, never did sports. I power lifted a little bit, but like the furthest I ran was basically chasing the ice cream truck down the road like that. <laughs> that was my form of endurance sports, you know, like a hundred meter dash to the ice cream cone. Basically. That's where the speed comes That's from. That's where the speed, because when, when there's a prize, you run quickly, you know? Um, and so actually when uh, probably about 2017, I was doing some shopping in the grocery store and this guy just walks up to me and is like, hey, I see your cane you're blind, you should come to this group in Central Park. And obviously when someone walks up to you like that, you think they're trying to sell you on politics <laughs> or some other type of cult or, you know. So I, I went home, I Googled Achilles International. I'm like, oh, that's, it's an organization that does, you know, adaptive sports, gets people with disabilities into like marathons and running things and stuff like that. Like, oh, that's pretty cool. So I showed up and five years later, here I am. <laughs> wow, I love your story. I think it's one of the all time great, like New York City random, you know, people just mm -hmm. talking to strangers and something amazing coming out of it. Yeah. Um, it's it's really cool. And and so, you know, when you when you looked up Achilles and you showed up for your first workout, what was that whole experience like? What were your first impressions of being with Achilles? So there was a lot of people, right? And being totally blind, so I have no light perception or anything like that. So I can't see a single thing. And so when I'm in a group of people, sometimes it can be a little overwhelming, right? Because all you hear is just a whole bunch of voices around you. You don't know who anyone is. And, you know, it's just, it, it, it's a little disorienting. So showing up, right, I was introduced to the, the back then, who was the director, the guy before me, he paired me up with a guide, a guy named Kevin, and we did our, our first ever run. And I remember I did, it was a four mile run. I didn't know what four miles was. It was like <laughs> a five minute ordeal I was signing myself up for or like two hours, you know, I had no idea. And I couldn't walk for like five days after that. <laughs> yeah, but it's 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 something that you know. There's so many people with disabilities who don't have the opportunity to do any type of sport, right? Or they don't have the opportunity to be even active. Right. And so, like me growing up, there's no gym class, right? There's no adaptive gym. So like you're there writing essays about soccer. So it's 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 just it's a very special situation where I'm like, oh, this is a whole new world that I'm discovering. And it just, it just opened up a whole different thing for me. Yeah. Totally. There's two sides of it that I think are really amazing for someone who had no real background in athletics before joining Achilles. Uh, there's sort of the, the physical side of like, I have to learn how to run, but I also have to learn how to adapt to this style of training yeah. where I have a guide and you run with a tether. And so mm -hmm. can you share some thoughts on that? And then what was it like to like struggle to learn how to run at all first, which would be hard for anybody? <laughs> But, but to also kind of learn how to make running work for you. Yes. So the biggest thing was the idea of letting go control, right? Because mm. when I walk, I don't have a, a service animal. I have a cane. And, you know, for those, it's just, right, it's a really long white cane. You swing it from side to side. That's how you feel where things are. So, like, you feel there's a sense of control, right, that I know where the things around me are. When you're running, especially if you're totally blind, you're just trusting 100%, right? Like totally. they could very well just run you into a brick wall and you'd have no clue, right? So <laughs> it's very, you're just, you just have to let go and just you're running into this emptiness, this nothingness, and you're just trusting that it's fine and it's okay. 
And now I, part of my job is training new guys. So I run with new people all the time. It's not a big deal now. But right. the, when I first joined, it was like, oh my goodness, like this is, <laughs> you're, it's basically trust falls constantly. You yeah, know? yeah. And so now, and a very special part of running for a lot of our athletes is that bond with the guide, right? Because you form friendships, you, you like some of the guides are the most, like the closest people that I know that, that I feel super close to. So it's, it's, it's a lot, it's multifaceted for sure. That's awesome. Yeah. Finding the motivation to train is really hard for, for almost anybody. When you just start out with mm -hmm. Achilles and you realize like, oh, this is really hard. What was that thing that kept you coming back for more and more that was just like, I love this? What yes. was that special magic sauce? The second time I showed up, I ran into the guy by the name of Charles Catherine, and he's also totally blind. And he was the director of the triathlon program back then. And I, I bump him to him almost literally as we're walking from the bus stop. We like cross canes, you know, there's a moment of who are you? you know? But we, we figured out, right, we're going, we're both going to the same place. So we start walking together and he's telling me about adaptive triathlon. And I didn't know how to swim and I'd never ridden a tandem bike before, but he basically recruited me in the five blocks it took to walk from the bus stop to the, to the workout. <laughs> and I'd say two things. One trying new things, right? Being able to do something that I never thought was possible, let alone consider right doing. Right. And so that's half of it. The other half would be just pushing myself, testing my limits in a way that, again, I didn't think was possible. So there, right, there's so many times, both in training and racing, where you're exploring parts of yourself that you never thought existed. Yeah. That really attracted itself to me. I just, I really, I love getting myself to the point of contemplating very seriously quitting <laughs> or failure or <laughs> yeah. just you know playing with that border of just am i going to be able to do this or am i going to fail and just pushing that boundary slightly further each time you know like that really really appeals to me it's like a roller coaster ride where yeah. you know you you get to the top and it's like wow this is really high up this is crazy this is scary mm -hmm. this is intimidating this was tough tough to just climb up here and then you have that awesome ride down where you know, it's, it's the running the Boston Marathon. It's, you know, some of your other heights that you've achieved. And, and then you get really, really excited for that next, you know, climb up to the top. And, yeah. uh, and you never really know how high up each, each rise is going to go, which is really exciting. Um, and that's something that, you know, just everybody can relate to, which is one of the cool things about, uh, uh, you know, running and, and triathlons. So, and so this is really fascinating to me because yeah. I've always struggled with you know, everything outside of running. I could never learn how to swim well. I never really learned how to ride a bike. As a fellow New Yorker, I don't know, I don't know how you got the skills, but, um, but I, I never learned how to ride a bike and I'm no good at it even when I do somehow manage to balance myself on <laughs> one. But running is one thing. Can you tell us what it's like to be able to participate in all three sports involved in triathlon? Definitely. So I guess starting with the swim, the hardest part for someone who's totally blind to learn how to swim is the stroke, but the, the, the hard part about learning stroke is there's no concept of what the stroke is supposed to look like, right? I think if you take most people, even if they're not swimmers, and you ask them, can you visualize what it's supposed to look like, a freestyle stroke? You can watch video, you know, they, they all see Michael Phelps, so they're like, you can see what it's supposed to be versus trying to explain all that to someone who's totally blind, who's never seen a swim stroke in their life, it, that's, I would say, the hardest thing. And so when we get new athletes who've never seen, it's like it's literally a matter of lying them down on the ground next to the, the, the pool deck and just moving, like manipulating their body. That is the only way that they're even going to vaguely understand what it's supposed to be like. And it's just, it's a process and it could take years for them to just, you know, because obviously you're moving the body, but it's not, it's not in motion, right? It's not as dynamic right, as it should be. Yeah. And so running, I feel like, is a little easier for people to pick up because, you know, you're walking, you're, right? It's more of a natural thing. Swim stroke, eh, not so much, you yeah. know? <laughs> so I really struggle, and I still do. Swimming is definitely my weakest of the three. And technique and form and just trying to adjust little inches or, or millimeters of, like, this is where your finger's supposed to enter, this is where you're supposed to do, and finding non-visual ways to associate those things. So. Mm -hmm. Instead of, you know, picturing my hand entering at a certain point, thinking in relation to the top of my head, it's, you know, my forearm is grazing my ear. So trying to find tactile ways to think about it, that's, that's really hard. And then you introduce open water, then it's just yeah. like, 
the waves are crashing around you. If you're in a race, people are all around you, like kicking you and punching you in the head. It introduces a whole other thing. It's terrifying. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Just yeah. thinking about it. Yeah. So it's, but it's fun too, right? Because that's the challenge. Yeah. If it was easy, I don't think it would be anywhere near as fun or challenging. Well, obviously not as challenging, but not as attractive. You know, part of the attraction is the fact that it's hard. What keeps you coming back to do it again and again? I really like finding out what I can do, you know, yeah. pushing, pushing the limits. And I think, I mean, it's super cliche, right? Like push yourself to the limits and all that stuff. But it's really the, that case of I, first, I love the process. It's not just the end result, right? I, right. I love the, the process of training and grinding and going out on the runs that I don't feel like waking up at whatever, you know, insane <laughs> right. hour of the morning, like. All those little building blocks that build to a race performance, I really enjoy all of those parts as well. I'm still doing it. Yeah, you know? no, absolutely. You have to love yeah, the process. You got to love the process. Yeah. You want to find it, uh, the things you enjoy about it so much that you're making excuses to go do it yes. rather than making the excuses to get out of it. Yes. So that's yes. awesome. So at what point did you realize, like, this isn't just something that I can do. It's something that, like, I'm, I'm pretty darn good at. Uh, when, when did you realize that you had this sort of untapped potential for, for this? <laughs> I don't even know if I've realized that. I just, <laughs> I just enjoy it so much that I just do it. And inc there was never one race performance where I just, it was like amazing. Like, oh my God, I have arrived. You know, like yeah, yeah, every yeah. race performance is just small incremental improvements. And it just continues that, that consistency of small incremental totally. improvements, well, you know, both in like finish times and, and things, but also just performance wise, you know, it's just. Yeah. I don't know. It's, uh, there's, there's so many things in, in endurance sports that you can do and so many things that I haven't done yet. It's like, let me, let me try to check some of those things out. You know? <laughs> awesome. I want to rewind for a second. I want to talk a little bit more about Achilles International and obviously your role there. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit about what it means to you to be the director of the New York City chapter, which I think is yeah. it's one of the biggest chapters in the world, if not the biggest. Yeah. yeah so New York City, it's our flagship chapter. Yeah. And right now we're actually in a pretty exciting time of Achilles because we are we're trying to grow the New York City model into other areas around the country, awesome. around the world. And so like we're targeting certain chapters around the country. We basically we have probably like 60, give or take a few um, chapters spread all across the world. For example, our Norway chapter does a little bit of cross country skiing, cool. right? Because of the winter time, you can't run. So but minus those little variants. It's basically getting people with all different types of disabilities involved in mainstream sports centered around like endurance events, so marathons, 5Ks, things like that. And the exciting thing is obviously I, I joined as an athlete first. Right. And, uh, you know, as a couple of years went by, I, I joined first the leadership structure of our multi-sport, the Tri, tri Achilles, and then I moved over to the New York City uh, metro area. So that's how, that's how I'm where I'm at now. And it's just, it's, it's fun because, you know, how many people can claim that their job that, that they have to do every single day is actually something that they really, really enjoy doing and they feel passionately about, right? I am like fully into this, right? Both Absolutely. as an athlete and as an employee, obviously. And so that's just this very, very cool and special place to be. Yeah. Now, when I heard that you were going to fill that role, I was like, yes, like, oh, awesome. No, because... no, what are we, what are we in for? <laughs> the person who, whose place you took was amazing, too. Mm -hmm. And so Achilles has just been kind of blessed with great leadership uh, across the board. And But it's really special having an, uh, an Achilles athlete fill this kind of role because you yeah. can really understand where the athletes are coming from and you understand the importance of the relationship with the guides. Yeah. What's it like when a new athlete comes and... How do you approach them to get them to feel really welcome? The reason why I went so deep into Achilles so quickly was that conversation I had with the triathlon Captain Charles on the second time mm -hmm. I showed up to Achilles. Him being totally blind and to me at the time, I mean, still is, like totally independent, was, you know, doing his own thing, was coming from a job that he had, a, you know, an actual job. <laughs> I was in college back then, right? It's like, I didn't know what, it, I didn't know all that. So like he had his... He had his life together, yep. right? And not only together, but he was thriving, right? And he was going out racing. He would race for the French national team in triathlon. Like he was, he had it, you know? And it was such an inspirational thing for me as a you know young adult, I guess, blind person who was just trying to figure out like what is possible. Mm -hmm. And so I think having people who are in positions of leadership or at least in influential positions who are similar to the people we're welcoming, right? I'll talk to a new athlete 
and they'll have all these concerns and it's like, oh no, but you know, they're trying to explain to me why I don't understand that, you know, why it's like, it feels maybe scary to, to come out to the park and meet people that I know. I'm like, bro, I get it. I'm totally blind. <laughs> I was in your position. They're like, wait a second, you're blind? Oh, okay, cool. Just being able to relate to athletes, I think is, is so important and never forgetting the roots, right? Never forgetting like I'm primarily, I was an athlete first and I'll always be an athlete athlete in the sense of Achilles, right? Athlete, we call people with disabilities athletes. So like I'm a person who's blind first and then, you know, the rest of it comes. It's awesome. You can add like a role model, you know, (laughs) hero, all all those titles to that as well. Um, Yeah. So thinking about, um, you know, what you've got going on moving forward, you just ran the Boston Marathon. uh, Amazing time. Three hours, 37 minutes. You were looking really strong as I as I saw you on the course. Yeah. Just describe what that feeling was like um, coming to Boston and and po- posting a really great time. And uh, you know, Boston is such a it's such a holy grail for so many runners yeah. uh, around the world. What was that experience like for you? I learned a few things. <laughs> I learned a few things. One, um, training's important. Yes, <laughs> preparation's important. Uh, my so Boston's was April eighteenth. Yep. Um, I ran a, a half marathon the month before in New York City. That was my longest run leading up to Boston. Wow. And I got COVID right after the half. So I spent like two and a half weeks with zero running. Wow. And so like, I mean, I say that all, all to the point being just like, I, I came into it obviously not as prepared as I should be for a marathon for any race. And so the mindset was very much just, oh, it's gonna be a fun race. You know, we had 65 give or take Achilles people there. Like, that's going to be such a cool opportunity. I'm going to see a whole bunch of people I haven't seen, whatever. It's going to be a fun weekend, right? The day before, we all went to the Red Sox game, drank like six beers. It was fine. You know, it was just supposed to be a fun weekend, which it was. It was so much fun. And we get to the race and maybe halfway through the race, well, before we even get to halfway through the race, I normally don't start counting miles, like playing mind games and things with myself to like mile 18, 19, right? That's when it starts... You, you, you know, you start grinding oh, yeah. it a little. I was counting miles at mile like four. Like I was like, oh, no. there's a problem. It was like the 5K mark. And I'm like, wait a second. Okay, I have another like 23 miles of this. Like this <laughs> is not going to end well. Right, and those first two were supposed yeah. to be the easy miles. <laughs> exactly. And I'm like, what a second. This, yeah, this is not. But we just, we just kept going, right? And we were, I was doing the math in my head. I'm like, wait a second. I can PR this this marathon. Yep. And all that to say, like, preparation is super important, obviously, but at the end of the day, I think you just sometimes need to send it, do epic things and see what happens. You know Absolutely. What I mean? <laughs> yeah. Well, there's this great sign at the top of Heartbreak Hill that says um, something like uh, your training got you to Newton, your heart will get you to Boston. So true because those hills kind of destroy everybody. Yeah. There <laughs> were so many times where I wanted to walk. Where yeah. I stopped so many times and it just, those little games, right? You play with yourself to stop yourself from walking or to stop yourself from slowing down or whatever it is you know you shouldn't do, but you really, really want to do. Totally. So that was another thing. I, I've never done a marathon with only one guide. I normally have at least two guides. Right. And it's just, you know, super helpful, right? Because you, you have your primary guide who is holding the tether with you. And then ideally, you'd have a second guide to run and get fuel from the aid station. So you don't have to like try to navigate a blind person inside right. 100 people at the aid station or just playing interference as people are passing you or you're passing other people, you know? So doing this race with only one guide, that was, that was a definitely a new thing. But if I had to do it with one guide, like that dude, Crick, I could not <laughs> ask for a better guy. Like he was on it. He was like living it, yelling at the top of his lungs. Like That's awesome. every time I was like, it was uphill and I wanted to walk, he'd like yell at the crowds, like, let's go. He'd like make everyone cheer. And I'm like, oh crap, now. Now I can't walk because now everyone's here and I like, well, you know, like you guilted me into not exactly. walking basically. You That's know? awesome. What's that feeling like when you cross the finish line with your guide? The guy just ran exactly what the athlete just ran. Plus they're paying attention to everything else, right? right. Other people fueling, making sure your athlete's not, you know, like crashing into any, it's, it's definitely not an easy job. And so when you cross that finish line, it's obviously super special because of what you just did, but it's more special because of now you have this bond, right? Yeah. This with this other human being that you just shared this experience with, and it's never going to be another experience exactly the same ever again, right? Every every race is different, every experience is different, and now you just shared that with another human being. Like that's a very very special thing, 
So that's awesome. Yeah, can't you can't really put it into words, but like that's that's what it is. Totally. And speaking of special things, <laughs> um, the Paralympics, we got to talk about that. The <laughs> the Olympic trials. So you actually qualified for the Olympic trials. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. I wanted to do triathlon first, mm-hmm. um, and then I actually got run over by an eighteen wheel truck. This oh my was, god! Yeah, yeah, it was his finals week <laughs> of college. That's that kind of was the thing that took me out. <laughs> And so I basically, I couldn't do the races that I needed to do to get the points wow. for triathlon. But with cycling, the qualification is a little simpler. It's not as many, you know, points, things. So you, it, it was a little more straightforward. And so I decided to just switch from triathlon to cycling just for that, you know, that one event. Yeah. And so that's what got me to Minneapolis right before Tokyo to, to do trials. And so it was definitely a, an interesting experience. It, it helped my cycling a lot, right? Obviously going from three sports to now only focusing on one. Um, it didn't help my running because I stopped running for a whole year, basically. Yeah. So that <laughs> didn't help my running. But yeah, it, it, it was very cool. Everything they gave you had like USA on it. So that's, Yeah, it's pretty epic. I mean, so few people get to reach that sort of level mm-hmm. um, and take part of such an exclusive event. So it's really cool. You know, I'm sure... Even even though, you know, I'm sure you wish that you'd made it. I know you had big goals to get to Tokyo, mm-hmm. um, but still, like, just, just the fact you're a part of it is something that uh, people spend their entire life aspiring for. So it's pretty awesome. At the end of the day, it's like, all right, keep it going, you know, keep yeah, it pushing. Yeah, and next one's right around the corner, too. Yeah. not that far away. That's so right. That's, uh, 24. that's right. So <laughs> keep working hard. Yeah. So I always like to ask the question, because obviously you've, you've accomplished a lot of things, and you've had many great feats and achievements. But I always like to ask the question of people, what's one really humbling learning experience that you had in your running or triathlon career up to this point that made you just go like, wow, that was rough. You know, I got I got to take some lesson from this. If there's one thing I would say. When I first started getting into triathlon, again, I couldn't swim, right? Like I literally didn't know how to swim and couldn't swim. But I was like, all right, the whole team's doing triathlon. Let me sign up for it. And so I, I honestly don't want to think what would happen if I actually had to swim. Basically, the first three triathlons I signed up for, for whatever reason, either water contamination or, or, or you know, storms, the That's swim right. is canceled. That's right. And so that fourth race where it actually, the swim was on, that, like, going through that race, and, like, I didn't, you know, I, you try, obviously try to block it out while you're racing, but after, like afterwards reflecting on the amount of just struggle and, and uh, you know, tearing out oh, na- yeah. just <laughs> how that, that swim went and just realizing like, wow, like that, if that could have gone in so many different ways and most of those were pointing south, you know? Yeah. <laughs> All that to say that, you know, I think there's a time and a place for sending it. Mm-hmm. Um, I, that will always be my default, <laughs> but also being trying to be more objective about totally. things and just realizing like, all right, what's realistic and what's not. And that's, I mean, honestly, that's helped me in terms of future racing. Um, after that happened, just figuring out like, this is my strategy, this is my plan, like what, what should I do, which, you know. So it just helped put things in perspective a little bit. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> totally. Yeah, no, we all kind of need that once in a while. Otherwise, yeah. we'll, we'll never be able to really gain the the wisdom that we need in order to really unlock our full potential as athletes. Totally. One other thing that's coming to mind is actually the first time I came in dead last in the race. <laughs> <laughs> that was it was my my first like professional, I guess, race representing wow. USA. And I was dead last in the men's division wow. out of eight people. So a, a lot of para races are very small fields. Right. And so it was eight, I think it was like eight or nine people. And I was the eighth or ninth. <laughs> and so like that was like, wow, I'm I'm no longer in the Central Park. Like, That's right. Here, here, like this is this is a different scene. Let me, you know, let, let's get in it a much on, bigger you know? pond now. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, looking forward now, you, your next big goal is to run. Well, I should say to do your first. Uh, Ironman. And yeah, so you've got yeah. two that you're signed up for, you mentioned earlier. Yeah. So I have two this year. One of them is a requirement. So the, the big goal is an event called Ultraman. And it's basically an ultra Ironman. And it's it's over three days. And you're basically, I could get, 
it's slightly off, but it's basically a six mile swim, maybe like a 260 ish mile bike ride, and then a 52 mile run. That's crazy. And so, yeah, a little, <laughs> but it's over three days. Oh, oh and, okay. Then it's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the, the requirement to do that is to finish an Ironman. And so, one of those events, you know, this year, the Ironman is to qualify for that. Wow. Um, I, the reason why I have two, mainly, I mean, Two is better than one, right? Why, why totally. not? Why not? <laughs> and also, like, I don't want to put all my eggs in one basket, right? So right. I have I have two planned. One in uh, pro- most likely le- uh, l- late August, mm-hmm. and the other one two weeks after New York City Marathon, November twenty. Nice. So, Whoa. Yeah. So wow. the, the marathon will be kind of the tune up, like the, right, the, the yeah. long run. Yeah, the marathon will be a little fun into, run, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then Ironman Arizona in November. So, yeah, I've never done. I've done half Ironman, obviously, but never full. And I'm curious, my, my prediction is that it won't be like, it'll be hard, but I, I think the hardest part will just be sitting on that bike seat for that long. Like, that's, a, that's a long time to have your butt on a hard wedge of an aero bike seat. You know, like that's, that's a long that's, time. That's one thing I'm not missing out on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I don't, I'm curious. I mean, it'll be fun. It'll be a new thing. Wow. What sort of training goes into that? Is it just, you're just doing a lot more volume? Is it? Uh, yeah. more, more days a week, more frequency. How, how are you managing the training for that and just tr- also trying to balance just like a normal life? Yeah, having a life, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, definitely, definitely more volume. The hardest part with that, I think, will be finding, with any training, right, as a blind athlete, is yep. finding guides. The guide who is also crazy um, enough to do yeah, that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's not even, honestly, it's not even finding the race guide because finding a guide to do a race like that, like, it's, it's you know, it's, it's not easy but it's not yeah. difficult either like uh, you can probably reach out to them. yeah no i mean it sounds epic to me like, yeah, i'm like yeah. i'm ready to sign yeah, up yeah, for exactly, it based exactly. on what you're saying i'm, I'm it's, pumped yeah it's finding the, the guides to train with yes. right the, the yeah. guy that'll ride a four-hour bike ride every sunday morning like for for three months that's the hard part yeah and so it, it's gonna be that's why i'm so fortunate to have you know a crew not just a couple guys but i have like enough people that i can tap and just rely on for you know, long bike rides, long runs, long swims. That's another thing. Like two, three hours. Yeah, maybe not two, three hours for the Ironman, but definitely for the Ultraman, like having multiple hour swims. Just, yeah, it's, again, I'm, I'm excited. So my main event is short course, right? For, for Paralympics, stuff right. like that. I'm very excited to see what this long, long volume does for short course performance. Because obviously like, it won't translate immediately, but that volume then sharpened to totally. an end, like that, that should be super cool. Totally, it's like when runners do like a nice base building phase. Yes, totally. And they come back and they do speed work and it's like, oh my gosh, yes. like, wow, where did the speed come from? <laughs> yeah. I haven't been doing any speed work, but all of a sudden the speed is just there or that, that aerobic yes. engine is just so much stronger. Yeah, that's, that's a really good point too. So, wow, man, I, <laughs> so much respect. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so in terms of the, the training, uh, you know, we obviously, we went through a couple of really tough years and mm-hmm. I'm sure it hit, it hit everybody really hard, you know, going through the pandemic, but I'm sure to a degree it hit Achilles athletes really, really hard because all of a sudden, you know, you, you're not supposed to be with anyone, but you mm-hmm. need guides to be able to train. So tell us a little bit about what that experience was like and, and how you got through it. Yeah. Obviously, when I do any type of outdoor training, it's with a guide. And when you're being told you're not allowed to come six foot you know near any type of it's like what are you gonna do have a six foot long rope tether like that's <laughs> you're basically on a dog you know a dog right. leash and got like it it was it for uh, probably a good eight months at least when it first started when there was like no interaction at you know no coming yeah. close to people i mean we didn't have workouts right because right. how are you gonna how are you gonna pair a hundred people showing up to a park half with athletes half guys and just have them run together you know that's right it was hard but i should say i'm i'm very proud of Achilles and what we were able to do because we basically right when things shut down we started doing all like a bunch of virtual programming back when people yeah. were still into it you know <laughs> and I mean multiple times a week workouts people like athletes would zoom in we talk them through different movements and things like we kept people moving which is very cool but obviously nothing like just going out for a run or or bike ride or swim and so you know trying to trying to build your little unit of people that you're fine to be exposed to right. and, and just you know these are the these are the two uh, to the two guides that I will use every week and just not trying to stray from that it was it's a whole learning experience right because again I mean everyone else too just you, you were so much more limited you know and 
as a blind athlete, like there's so much more of an emphasis on dealing with people, with other human beings, right? Both in training and just everyday life. Totally. Yeah. I mean, you go to the grocery store, right? Uh, if you're totally blind, you go to the grocery store. What's the most common thing a blind person will do? Well, they'll ask a store person to help them find something. Mm -hmm. Well, if you can't come close to a store person, how are you supposed to do that? You know, so right, even yeah. as something simple as grocery shop, like it introduced a whole new element of challenge to what's already not like a super simple, simple thing. So very we, happy we, things are opening up. now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it sounds like you had a nice supportive like pod of people uh, who were able to come through for you, which is awesome. Uh, mm -hmm. But I'm sure it was very, very special when eventually things opened up a little bit more and we were able to start doing the workouts again in Central Park. Um, what was that initial feeling like when everybody was finally able to to be together for that mm -hmm. first couple of workouts? Things shut down, right? March of 2020. We right. reopened probably around September of 2020. Right. And I'm telling you that people were just happy to stand there and just... <laughs> talk at each other from yeah. uh, you know because back there obviously like vaccines were out were not out yet and things so you still kind of had to distance and you know we had to wear masks when gathering so there were still those restrictions yep. but people like just stand there five feet apart from each other and just like talk at each other in the park for like hours <laughs> just, you yeah. know, just happy to like not be on a computer monitor you know so a, a typical saturday morning achilles workout will have anywhere from 30 to 60 people with disabilities mm -hmm. and then the same number to double of guides so we might have like 100 people show up to an achilles workout um when we first reopened we had to limit numbers and so we had two waves of 20 and so 40 people total and you know as the months went on we slowly increased and increased and slowly reduced restrictions as you know we were allowed to to the point where now things are basically you know as long as you're vaccinated things are basically open nice so, yeah I run Central Park basically Saturday morning myself, and I've used that as sort of my long run day. Yeah. And uh, it's been great seeing Achilles back out there. And I always see the same friendly faces over and over again <laughs> running, the, running the loop. And, uh, you know, it's just awesome. You guys, you guys are an amazing organization, and there's so many inspiring stories and all kinds of people who have overcome all kinds of different challenges, you know. Yeah. Uh, and the fact that everybody can, can get together, it's, to me, it's just it's evidence that everybody um, can really relate fundamentally on certain levels um, that uh, a lot of people just don't even think about, you know, in their everyday yeah. lives. Honestly, that's one of the special things I think about Achilles because I've, like, I've been involved in organizations in the past, right? Yeah. Blind organization, things like that. And the, the, the real unique thing about Achilles is the diversity, right? right? It's not just a blind running group. It's not just a wheelchair running. It's every type of categorized disability, right? right. And it's not only included, people are just interacting and mingling, which seems like a simple thing, but it's such a rare, honestly, thing in the yeah. disability community because so much of the disability community is segregated between what disability you have, maybe where you're from, what part of the city or, right. you know. And like what specific needs you have. Yeah, and yeah. yeah. And, and with Achilles, it's like, you know, your best, you might be a blind dude and your best friend's like a person in a wheelchair and, you know, you go do the adaptive baseball to get out of like, it's, right. it's just <laughs> the diversity and Again, because it's people with disabilities, obviously every every type of demographic, every type of socioeconomic class might have someone with a disability, right? So totally. you're having someone who literally was homeless six months ago and they're, you know, going out to lunch after a workout with someone who runs a hedge fund or something. You know, it's like right. these things that you would never see in just I guess in real life, right? This is real life. Totally, like in, yeah. in, in yeah, day to day yeah. life. It's, it's just, it's common. It's not even a, a thing, you know, a spectacle in Achilles anymore because that's just what it is, you know? And that's, as I got to know Achilles more, that was one of the, the special things that just kept me coming back. It's, it's the community, you know? Yeah, it's like everybody's fundamental need, it goes just beyond whatever their disability needs are. Everybody needs camaraderie. Everybody needs yeah. a chance to achieve something extraordinary. And so I think that, yeah, like everything you just said, that's, that's what I really love and that's what I found really appealing as a filmmaker you know, trying to uh, kind of understand, like, what is this magic thing mm -hmm. that is clearly there at Achilles uh, that people need to know about? So, like, if someone's interested in being a guide, what, what would they go do right now? Totally. So easiest thing, AchillesInternational.org, right? That home, that home page, AchillesInternational.org, that basically has every, every link that you can possibly imagine mm -hmm. in terms of getting involved. Um, to be a volunteer, first, you have to be paired with a chapter, and that's all, that's all like, handled internally. Yep. 
um, you fill out the form, you basically put where you are and we'll, you know, stick you wherever the closest chapter is. Um, and we're, we're actually, so we're doing guide training now, which we didn't used to nice. do before the, uh, before COVID. We, we used more experienced guides to train new guides, like as they were running, cool. which worked, it was fine, but like not as standardized. And so now we're having formalized guide, you know, orientations and trainings. Um, and so you'd come out for a guide training, you learn about Achilles, how to hold a tether, how to give verbal cues, obstacles and directional cues, things like that. Uh, and then you go out for your run. And when you come back, you're basically done and you're free to sign up for any upcoming workout. And so, you know, I lead all the Central Park workouts. Um, a lot of uh, volunteers, they see Achilles in the park because of the, the very, very obnoxiously bright colored, <laughs> you know, neon shirts. <laughs> either again in the park or running in marathons and things so that's how people find their way uh to us yep. and we just train them up as guides or they participate as um charity runners that's like another way that right. people like to to do they'll you know get guaranteed entry in berlin marathon york city marathon you know whatever it is and they, they have a chance to write, uh, run in support of achilles so. awesome what are some things that you're you're hoping to achieve uh either in the blind community or just in general with your career beyond uh, what you're doing right now? Like, what are the big next steps? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Funny you mention that. So uh, I'm getting back into music writing. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, and so it, it's it's kind of all interconnected, right? Because yeah. as I get more involved and, and, you know, learn more about myself athletically, that then translates to other parts of my life, both, you know, professionally, which I guess professionally can be construed as athletically because it's a case. Right. But also just creatively, right? Like doing new things. Um, yeah, definitely music writing is a big thing. I went to a John Mayer concert at the, at the Garden. Nice. Uh, I think that was like two months ago. And awesome. ever since then, I didn't touch my guitar since before COVID. And I came back from that concert and I was like, it's time. I need to, I need to, touch, <laughs> I need to pick up this guitar. That's awesome. How long have yeah. you been playing music? Uh, I picked up piano when I was five years old. Wow. And then switched to guitar in high school because I'm like, what are all the girls into? Oh, like, yeah. Little did I know, piano, I should have stick with piano, oh, right? Yeah. Piano is the way to do it. But at the time, I just watched School of Rock, right? The movie with oh, Jack yeah. Black. And I was like, guitar is where it's at. Like, that's where the cool people are at. <laughs> so I switched to guitar, and that's how I picked it up in high school. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Awesome. So definitely just explore more creative stuff. I think what the pandemic, right, has taught a lot of people, me included, is you just got to do things that you want to do. Totally responsibly speak, you know, not obviously don't go crazy, but like, I don't, I don't see, and I never really saw the purpose of putting things off, but like, I don't want to regret not having done something. Right. Right. So whether it's athletically or otherwise, or, you know, hiking this big thing, or I don't know, going to some rave in London next, you know, mm -hmm. it's like, I, I feel like there was a hesitation. Like it's easy to stay in your groove. Right. Yeah. And I think what what the last couple of years have taught me is maybe push myself out of that groove a little bit, you know, and you can always come back to it. Totally. But maybe explore some new things, you know, at this point, I would just say, like, is there is there anything else that you want to talk about? Is there anything that you wanted to uh, that I wouldn't have ordinarily thought to bring up? Honestly, I'll say when I, when I first walked in here, um, the, the question was, you're going to wear your Boston shirt or a guy shirt, <laughs> right? And you're like, well, you haven't technically guided uh -uh. or you haven't gotten me. So I think I know where this is going. Yeah. So I think, I think you need to, I think we got to do a race together. Man. Absolutely, man. <laughs> I don't know about Ultraman, but. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That way, you know, next time you can wear a guy shirt. Absolutely. And, uh, it'll be, it'll be all, yeah, all synced up. And I'll be, I'll be even more proud to wear the guide shirt legitimately than this Boston shirt right here. So. Oh, absolutely, man. <laughs> man. Yeah, I would love to. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> totally, totally. Well, Francesco, on that note, I just want to thank you so much. It's been an honor. It's been a blast chatting with you. And yeah, we're man. definitely going to run together sometime. Yeah, careful what you wish for, man. Uh -oh. <laughs> My guides, I have a tendency when, when things start hurting to start saying some really, really cringeworthy one-liners. All right. Really bad ones. Well, you've and never so... heard my cringeworthy one liners Oh, that's so... true. All right, that it's might be the... Be that a clash be... of the yeah. cringe. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, awesome. Well, thank yeah. you so much again, Francesco. It's always a pleasure chatting with you and an honor. And I want to thank Manhattan Neighborhood Network and Will Sanchez for having us. And until next time, gotta run. That was fun. That was fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.